So we're talking RV function and PA pressures today. Um, obviously, the report should include something about the RV based on images acquired for the RV. A report that lacks info about the RV is considered a deficient report. Of course, we understand if there are technical challenges, but absent these challenges, one should strive to make comments about RV size and function. So how do we assess the RV size? We have 2D images and we have 3D imaging. Brief comments about 3D later on, but really the main approach we use to assess RV is 2D imaging. So the 2D views we depend upon are the parasternal long axis views and the parasternal short axis views plus apical views. Which section of the RV do we visualize in the parasternal long axis view? You can measure what we call a proximal area of the RV outflow tract. The RV outflow tract could be thought of as a tunnel. It has a proximal segment and it has a more distal area. And we can get dimensions for both the proximal and distal areas. All measurements for dimensions and thickness, whether it is LV or RV, are end diastolic measurements. So we go from the RV anterior wall to the junction between the aorta and the interventricular septum. We can also look at the distal RV outflow tract from this view, which shows the anterior leave the anterior wall of the RV outflow tract and then the posterior wall. You can get it from the parasternal short axis view from the anterior wall of the RV to the aortic valve. And we can get the distal RV outflow tract also from the parasternal short axis view at the level of the aortic valve and pulmonic valve. Whether you measure the proximal RV outflow tract in paralong or in parashort views, these measurements should be very similar to one another. And the same comments apply for the distal. Whether you measure the distal in the view, parasternal long axis of the RV outflow tract and the PA, or in the parasternal short axis view at the level of the valves. Needless to say, they do not always match one another, though they should. Why the measurements may not be sort of very close to one another, or identical, because a lot depends on how oblique these views are and how perpendicular we are, for example, in the parasternal short axis views. Because of the difficulties of making sure of the planes you are sectioning the ventricle, most labs will not use these quantitative measurements. Having said that, these measurements would be your first look or are usually your first look at the right ventricle. And many times they will be signaling to you that there may be issues with the RV size or with the RV function, albeit the wall of the RV here is thinner than the wall that you would measure, say, in an apical view or that you would see in a subcostal view. There are unique diseases or disease processes that affect the RV outflow tract and may not necessarily affect the body of the ventricle. And so you may recognize an abnormality here, be it in the form of size abnormality or dysfunction abnormality. Sometimes cases of arrhythmogenic RV cardiomyopathy will manifest with abnormalities here and you may not readily detect them in other views. So we talked about the RV outflow tract. How about looking at other walls of the RV? The next view we want to look at is the parasternal long axis view, and you have the anterior wall of the ventricle, the posterior wall of the ventricle, and you have the tricuspid valve leaflets, the anterior and posterior leaflet. This is a frequent question where people are often asked, where do you see the posterior leaflet of the tricuspid valve? What view shows you that? Needless to say, it gives you an assessment of the RA, the RV. You can look at the tricuspid annulus. You can look at tricuspid valve pathology, annular dilatation, flay leaflets, etc. From an RV perspective, you want to look at the performance of this right ventricle. 
in general, the thickening of the right ventricle is not to the same magnitude as the left ventricle. So when you are comparing in your brain, don't expect to see the same thickening that you see in the LV, in the RV. But having said that, you should be familiar with what is normal because sometimes abnormalities, particularly in patients with coronary disease and certain vessels being affected, can get that anterior wall and you may not readily recognize it. Sometimes when we use contrast, say for LV, endocardial border, visualization as the contrast passes through the LV, through the RV on its way before it reaches the LV, you will be able to visualize the LV cavity and may give you a better appreciation of the RV endocardium. The same may also take place if you use saline contrast. So when you're looking at contrast studies and now you see the RV, this is an opportune time to get also at least an impression of what the RV size and function are like. Now we talk about the short axis views that will get you the right ventricle. As you know, the RV is crescent shaped. And so being crescent shaped, if you cut it this way versus that way versus more posteriorly, the shape of the crescent and, of, and thus the size of the crescent will vary. That's why assessment of RV size based on short axis views is not ideal. The same applies for echo as well as cardiac MR. So what are the walls we see in the short axis view? or we may be able to see in the short axis views. You have an anterior wall, you have a lateral or free wall, and you have an inferior or diaphragmatic wall that sits on the diaphragm. So we leave the short axis views, and now we go to the apical views. This is the standard apical four-chamber view. And as you see, the apical four-chamber view shows you the LV well and is ideal to get LV volumes, ejection fraction, etc. But is frequently not the best look at the RV. And sometimes we need a focused RV view and sometimes a modified four-chamber view. I'll speak quickly about the modified because I want to spend more time on the RV focused view. The modified view is geared to show you that lateral wall of the RV. As you look at this view, this is not a sort of a perpendicular view or not a, it's an oblique alignment with the heart. So size wise is not the view you want to use to measure RV dimensions. But its advantage is that it shows you the free wall and you can appreciate what is happening in the free wall in terms of performance. Also, if you are going to look for interatrial shunts, that's a good view to use when you give agitated saline contrast. It shows you the tricuspid valve leaflets. It can look at these. You can look at the tricuspid regurg. But as far as measurements, this is not the view to use. The focused RV apical four-chamber view focused on the RV is the one that is more rewarding. Notice that compared to the standard apical four-chamber view, you do not get to see the LV apex as well. But for the RV, that's what we want. What are the measurements we can do in the focused view? We can measure the basal dimension of the right ventricle. So this is basically a measurement below the tricuspid annulus plane. It is performed someplace in the basal third before the pap muscle. And you can also do another distal measurement, distal to the first one, more in the distal third after that papillary muscle, if you would. How reproducible are these measurements? If you pay attention to the view in which the measurement is performed in, and you try to reproduce the measurement in the same view, or if you're looking at the repeatability of a study, you aim to get the same view and then use it to get the measurements, this should be reproducible. Where problems happen with reproducibility is if someone measures it on the apical four, someone else uses an RV-focused view. So you can tell the RV-focused view will give you a somewhat larger RV basal dimension. 
Again, aside from dimensions, and we talked about transverse dimensions, you can measure as well the long axis in the updated guidelines 2015, the long axis dimension by itself is not that emphasized. <clears throat> what can you do with this view aside from these measurements? You will also look at the tricuspid valve. You can look at tricuspid regurgitation by color Doppler. You can see how that area changes from end diastole to end systole. You can align with the tricuspid annulus to look at the plane displacement in systole. You can acquire tricuspid tissue Doppler signals and so on. So it's an important view to do a lot of the measurements that we will talk about regarding RV systolic function. The two other views that you see below, one gets you part of the aorta, so more of a five-chamber view, and that one shows the moderator band. By the way, when you trace cavity of the RV, any trabeculations and the moderator band become part of the cavity, not part of the wall when you do your measurements. And then there is another view that can show you the coronary sinus, of more importance in certain diseases, but for most diseases, not really critical or needed. Then we go to the subcostal views, and you have the lateral wall, free wall, and you have a septum. Ideally, if you want to do RV wall thickness, because we say there is RV hypertrophy, this is the view you will use to get RV free wall thickness. And you want to zoom. Why do I want to zoom? Because the thickness is small, and when the thickness is small, to avoid measurement errors, or not to avoid measurement errors, but to minimize the measurement error, working with a zoomed view will help in that regard. Where do you measure it in the thickness? Again, end diastole. You want to exclude the epicardium or the Actually, the pericardium, you would include the epicardium. You go all the way med wall and to the endocardium, and that's the thickness that you end up measuring. This view also gets you a look at the interatrial septum, interatrial shunts, tricuspid valve, tricuspid regurg. You can to try and align with them. For experienced sonographers and for fellows who have spent a lot of time working on their scanning skills, it is possible to get a short axis view as you see below. And this could be very rewarding because sometimes we don't have a good parasternal view, say, in someone with obstructive airway disease. If you have the view down there, then you can align with RV outflow track. You can get pulse wave Doppler, and you can get very decent measurements. Blood supply of the RV. So why do I need to learn the blood supply of the RV in patients with coronary disease and RV dysfunction? They are not frequently seen, but sometimes you will see a patient with a normal ejection fraction or low normal EF or mildly depressed EF who have a lot of findings of systemic congestion, and the reason is the RV got a hit. So remember the parasternal view that shows you the RV inflow. You have the anterior wall and you have the inferior or diaphragmatic wall. The anterior wall gets its blood supply from the acute marginal branch of the right coronary artery. The diaphragmatic wall gets its blood supply from the posterior descending artery. If you are interested in the RV outflow tract, that comes from the conus branch, a branch that if cannulated can at times lead to ventricular arrhythmias. You can show more of the outflow tract in the, short, in the peristernal short axis view level of the valves. And this segment, as you see on this slide, comes from the, its blood supply, gets its blood supply from the acute marginal branch. Then we go to the epical views, and the free wall supply gets its, the free wall blood supply comes from the acute marginal branch. Most of the interventricular septum, the inferior interventricular septum gets its blood supply from the posterior descending artery. The very distal part of the septum, though, gets its blood supply from the LAD, and you are all familiar with LAD infarcts, where these segments can be hit to a variable extent, depending on how much of that area gets its blood from the LAD versus from the posterior descending branch. This slide illustrates the zooming for the RV free wall thickness and where you can measure it. 
And these are the dimensions we talked about, the minor dimensions at the base, at the mid, and the long axis dimension. And then some illustrations for the fractional area change. So we're shifting gears from simply dimensions and sizes now to systolic function of the right ventricle. We are familiar with end diastolic volumes and systolic volumes. For the RV, if you're working 2D, not 3D, we talk about end diastolic area and end systolic area. As you can see, it gets part of the right ventricle, but not the whole right ventricle. We haven't shown you what happens to the RV outflow tract area, for example. In the in that panel, if you, as you go from end diastole to end systole, the area visually dramatically decreases, and that is normal. Then you go to a stage where it does not decrease as much and doesn't decrease at all. So various grades of dysfunction. Typically, a 35% is recognized as lower limits of normal for the fractional area change. Investigators have looked at the RV fractional area change and attempted to relate it to RV ejection fraction by cardiac MR. The correlations in general are significant, but with a wide spread. You can see some studies where the relations or the correlation coefficient accounted for something as low as 16% of the variance to something as high as 50% or so of the variance. There are reasons why they do not necessarily match one another. Remember, this is just one area of the RV that we're looking at. Then come the questions of how well we see the endocardium in these views. If you end up with images like these, it's not a challenge. But more challenging images are the ones that cause problems. Another measurement, two other measurements are shown on that slide. One is the DPDT, and I would emphasize this mostly as a qualitative signal. Look at how the velocity in the ascending limb of the tricuspid regurg signal is rising. How steep the slope is, if you would, for velocity versus time. If it rises fast, it's because the RV pressure is rising fast. And when the RV pressure is rising fast, we draw the conclusion that RV function is normal. If it rises slowly, then the RV function is worse. You can look at the events during systole and during diastole with the same approach. If it takes a longer time in diastole, then it's a slower relaxation and it takes a longer time to decline. Where does this measurement cause errors? Most of the errors are in time measurements. As you see, the scale here is between every two points is about 200 milliseconds. You can make it 100 if, with some ultrasound systems if you can get faster sweep speeds, but in general, we are looking at very small values. And this is where the problem happens. So 30 milliseconds, 40 milliseconds, and so on. So I wouldn't recommend we sort of use that more of quantitation. Where you may see it is some research studies. On the other hand, some labs use the T index or the myocardial performance index more frequently. Before we say how we measure it, want to emphasize that the myocardial performance index is made up of three measurements. The ejection time from here to here, the isovolumic contraction time, and the isovolumic relaxation time. So for someone to come and say this is a measurement of RV systolic performance, it is not a measurement. It is not a pure measurement of RV systolic performance. Why? Because I am measuring time intervals, one during diastole, early diastole, isovolumic relaxation. And also it measures the time interval during the isovolumic contraction time. And this time interval can be prolonged, for example, in patients with bundle branch block. And so there have been several reports where individuals are clinically worse, but this time interval gets shorter, suggesting that they may be getting better. Mostly because the right atrial pressure goes higher and then the isovolumic relaxation time gets shorter. An efficient heart is a heart that spends most of this time interval ejecting blood and less time preparing to eject blood or waiting to get filled. 
So the longer the ejection time relative to the isovolumic contraction and to the isovolumic relaxation, the better the performance. As just mentioned, it is not a pure systolic index for the reasons we noted. How do we obtain it? We can obtain it by pulse wave Doppler, and we can obtain it by tissue Doppler at the lateral side of the tricuspid annulus. The one that is easier to, under to understand and to acquire from a single beat is shown below. And basically, you get the time interval of the systolic ejection velocity, that S or S prime. And then you get the isovolumic contraction time, which is short time here, and the time between the end of the ejection velocity and the beginning of the E prime velocity. Normal values are less than 0.54. As that gets exceeded, dysfunction is present. How do we get it by pulse wave Doppler? On the left side, it is not a challenge to get outflow through the left ventricular outflow tract and mitral inflow in the same cycle. We can place the sample volume midway between the mitral valve tips and the LV outflow tract. On the right side, however, you cannot get the flow through the RV outflow tract in the same beat that you get to see the flow through the tricuspid valve during diastole. So one of two things happen. Either we try to match RR intervals, and then we get the tricuspid inflow from one beat and the RV outflow tract from another beat, obviously different view, or use the tricuspid regurgitation time interval. Tricuspid regurg begins during isovolumic contraction, continues through ejection, and then during isovolumic relaxation. So if I get the total time interval of the tricuspid regurg and I subtract from that the ejection time through the RV outflow tract, then I have, add, then I have obtained these two time intervals, isovolumic contraction and isovolumic relaxation. And now we can work with it. How reproducible this measurement is for labs that do it more frequently than others, decent reproducibility. However, as you are aware, again, we are still not using the same cardiac cycle, TR from one beat and the RV outflow tract from another beat. The normal value is less than 0.43, and as that dimensionless parameter gets long higher value, the dysfunction is present. The 2015 guidelines went out of their way to say that this is one of the parameters that should be considered if you are reporting on the RV quantitatively. It's not the only one. The, the ones that were emphasized were this measurement, the RV, the uh, myocardial performance index, RV fractional area change, which we covered, TAPSI that you see on this slide and how it is measured, it is the perpendicular distance, not the oblique distance. And then the tricuspid S prime velocity, which you can get by pulse wave Doppler or by color-coded tissue Doppler, because color-coded tissue Doppler is a mean velocity as opposed to a peak velocity. Color Doppler tissue uh, S prime obtained by color tissue Doppler has a lower value. The normal value recognized for S prime by color is about six centimeters per second, so values less than that are abnormal. For pulse wave Doppler, the normal values are around 9.5 centimeters per second. So if you have higher values than that, that supposedly the function is normal. So what are the limitations of these tricuspid annular velocities? So first, there are technical issues. How well do I see the RV free wall? Where do I place the sample volume? Did I place it at the right spot or not? Is it in the RA? Is it in the RV as opposed to the side of the tricuspid annulus? As you move your sample volume down along the wall, that tricuspid velocity can drop. And we are talking short distance, but still few centimeters per second that can make a difference. Another technical point that can be a problem is includes alignment issues. So the alignment issues, if I am oblique, then that velocity will have a lower value just by the Doppler principle. You multiply that velocity by cosine the angle, and as you know, as you go from 0 to 90, the cosine keeps dropping from 1 to 0. However, say you are presented with an image 
where there is angulation, but despite that angulation, you are measuring a velocity of 12 centimeters per second, then it's normal because the true value will be higher than that. So we talked about technical challenges for this signal. Then there are real problems where even though I placed the sample correctly, the size of the sample volume is good, I end up with a velocity that looks normal, but clearly this is a ventricle that is very abnormal in terms of the extent of its dysfunction. Why this is the case? This happens because in systole, the motion of the RV is not only a vertical motion from the base to the apex, but also there is some degree of rotation. And that rotation has a vector in the longitudinal direction that affects the S prime. So now you are looking at two vectors adding up or summing up and giving you a higher velocity. So when you are looking at your data and you're adding them together, things have to flow. Example, you see a big ventricle, a fractional area change that is, say, 20% and you have what looks like a normal velocity, just because you see a normal velocity here, do not release the report as a normal RV function. Some physicians ask for these measurements. Obviously, physicians who ask for these measurements should be familiar with their limitations and what they mean. Um, the same for the TAPC limitation. Okay, now RV volumes by 3D. There is relatively limited experience for 3D RV volumes. It depends on getting images of the RV from several views and then putting them together, stitching them together from several beats. And then you end up with a model for the right ventricle like the one you see here in green. So you have the tricuspid valve, you have the pulmonic valve, and you have end diastolic and systolic volumes. For labs that have done the validation work against cardiac MR, they show good correlations. Again, variable ranges that you can see anywhere from an R of 0.6 to an R of 0.7 to 0.8, but still some degree of underestimation of RV volumes. The normal cutoff for RVEF is around 45%. When we look or when we comment about LV dimensions and LV volumes on the left side, we typically look for tables that show us how the size varies with gender and how it varies according to body surface area or height. Much less work is done for the right ventricle. And so if you're looking at extremes of sizes, somebody who has a very large body surface area, very tall, what you accept for them as, what you may accept for others as abnormal, you may well accept for them as being normal. So take account of the size of the individual. Okay. We can also look at deformation. This is a very early attempt using tissue Doppler to measure strain in the interventricular septum and the RV free wall, showing that it relates well with sonomicrometry in animals. We passed this stage and now we use speckle tracking. And that's an example of speckle tracking from the RV free wall and then from the whole RV. The idea of someone preferring to measure the free wall only as opposed to the whole RV is they'll say the interventricular septum is shared by the LV. So if I want a pure RV measurement, then it is the RV free wall that I should measure. And notice that the strain values are different. Higher for the RV free wall, I'm talking about absolute values, 29% versus 21% in this example. In general, it is recognized that values that are, in terms of absolute values that are less than 20%, these are abnormal hearts. The limitations for working with RV strain, similar to everything else, you start with the quality that you get, starts with the frame rate, and then you have differences in terms of different vendors and in terms of different software that is used. And there is really no consensus, aside from using this single number that I just mentioned, 20%, to signify the limits of what would be called normal versus abnormal. So now pulmonary hypertension. 
Pulmonary hypertension in the cath lab is not defined by PA systolic pressure. It is defined by mean PA pressure. And it's a pressure that exceeds 25 millimeters mercury. If you want to define pulmonary arterial hypertension, or we can say pulmonary hypertension not due to a cardiac etiology, you want to confirm that there is pulmonary hypertension, so more than 25. You want to confirm that the LV filling pressures are not exceeding 15 millimeters mercury, and then increase in the pulmonary vascular resistance. From an echo point of view, if the report can point to the pressure being elevated, ideally mean pressure, that the left atrial pressure is not more than 15 millimeters mercury, and you can give a surrogate for pulmonary vascular resistance, you have accomplished important objectives as far as not just saying there is pulmonary hypertension, but whether the cause is cardiac or non-cardiac. Can be very optimistic in several cases, and the current guidelines for pulmonary hypertension look upon echo as a screening tool, not as a definitive tool to make the diagnosis or even look at changes in response to disease-modifying drugs. So before we talk about mean PA pressure, let's talk about PA systolic. All of you do this day to day. We try to get tricuspid regurg signal by continuous wave Doppler from multiple windows because you can be having angulation with the direction of TR and the less angulation, the higher the velocity as we talked about it elsewhere. You need an estimate for right atrial pressure. We look at IVC, its diameter, its spontaneous collapse or its collapse with sniffing forced inspiratory effort. You look at the hepatic veins. If you have an incomplete jet and the patient is referred for diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension or estimate PA pressures, we want to give saline intravenously. And if you look at patients with pulmonary hypertension, the vast majority of them will have a TR signal that can be recorded and measured. And again, whatever you measure should be consistent with 2D. Example, you see a 2D with a flat septum, systole, and diastole, but you have a TR of 2.5. You do not want to report a pressure of 30 to 35 millimeters mercury in this case. Incomplete jet that nobody would use. A more complete jet with about 3.6, and you do the modified Bernoulli, so you have a transvalvular gradient in systole of 52, and then you add the RAP, you end up with the PA systolic. I know many of you know that, so we'll not dwell on it. Less frequently recognized and measured is the PA diastolic pressure. We record the PR signal by continuous wave Doppler in the parasternal short axis view. We still need an estimate for RAP, so we want the subcoastal views to look at the IVC and hepatic veins. Again, if you do not have a complete jet, you can give saline. The feasibility of recording satisfactory PR signals in general is lower than the feasibility of recording TR jet by continuous wave Doppler. Still, it can be decent in patients with pulmonary hypertension. For PA diastolic, you want to focus at the end diastolic velocity. So it's not the peak that you look at if you are asked about the PA diastolic. You look at the end diastolic velocity. And the equation that we use is 4V squared, where V is the end diastolic signal here, equals PA diastolic minus RAP. So if I know the end diastolic velocity and it's 2, then we look here at a 16, equals PA diastolic minus RAP. We can use the hepatic veins. We'll get to them later on in the talk to estimate RAP. So the PA diastolic ends up in that range clearly in the range of pulmonary hypertension. How do I estimate mean PA pressure by echo? In the earlier days, and for most senior echocardiographers, they are very familiar and comfortable reporting PA systolic pressure. Very few will report PA diastolic or will say something about the mean PA pressure. We just said that clinicians are more interested in the mean PA pressure than the PA systolic. The way you get mean PA pressure is, say, invasively, as well as non-invasively if you have substitutions, is you get the PA diastolic plus one-third pulse pressure. So I need the PR jet, I need the TR jet, and I need an estimate for RAP. 
At first glance, you say to yourself, I am looking for three measurements. I can make an error in each of these measurements, and obviously now the mean PA pressure will not be the same as what you would get by cath. I would submit to you that in extreme situations, when the mean PA pressure is clearly normal, when the mean PA pressure is way abnormal, we do a good job. In between is where there can be challenges. Another approach to report mean PA pressure is to look at the peak PR velocity. So it is this one. The end diastolic is for PA diastolic pressure. The peak velocity of the PR signal is what you use for mean PA pressure. And it could be as simple as 4V squared. If you want to be more compulsive, you need to add some estimate for RAP. And if you are more strict, the pressure that really counts at that time point is not the mean RAP, but more of the RV minimal pressure, which in patients with diastolic dysfunction is often elevated. But nevertheless, when people have used these approximations, they came up with good correlations, and therefore they are posted. So we talked about two methods now to estimate mean PA pressure. The third approach is this equation. This equation, if you look at it, was first published in abstract form. Many other investigators came up with similar equations, but not identical intercepts or slopes. Basically, you look at the acceleration time, how fast the velocity rises in the RV outflow tract. And if there is pulmonary hypertension, this time is short. If there isn't, then it gets longer. The magic number to remember is 100 milliseconds. The problem with this approach is people have said it's not necessarily linear. It could be logarithmic. People have also said that these time intervals depend a lot on the RR interval and the presence of conduction disturbances and so on, so it's not always accurate. But more recently, there has been some revitalization of this approach. What other methods are there to assess PA systolic, mean PA pressure? If someone has a high mean PA pressure, they have a high mean PA pressure not just because their PA diastolic is up. They have a high mean PA pressure because both PA systolic and diastolic pressures are up. So there is a re direct relation, be it linear or nonlinear, between the mean systolic between the mean PA pressure and between the PA systolic pressure. The higher the PA systolic pressure, the higher the mean PA pressure. That's a regression equation based on data obtained in the cath lab and also in patients. This is another equation that looks at the mean gradient during systole, not just at the peak gradient. More tedious, more headaches, and again, you can find isolated reports that use them, and you can find reports where all of that methodology was used and nothing s appeared as the most promising or the, the most trusted approach to get mean PA pressure. But nevertheless, you can get an assessment of mean PA pressure by echocardiograph. How about pulmonary vascular resistance? The concept of pulmonary vascular resi resistance is pressure overflow. So a group of investigators tried to make their life easier and make our life easier and said, okay, what do I have as a surrogate for pressure? They used the peak TR velocity. This is the 4V squared. And what do I have as a surrogate for flow, for cardiac output? Let us use the time velocity integral of the RV outflow track. That simplification at its first look makes sense. But what are the problems with this simplification? The problems is the TVI is not the same as the cardiac output or the stroke volume. We need RVOT diameter. So you can have different sized hearts where the TVI is small, but the RV outflow tract is wide enough that the stroke volume is normal, not reduced as you would have inferred just based on a reduced time velocity integral. The second one, this is 4V squared, doesn't even have the RAP added. And we just said we need the mean PA pressure, not the PA systolic pressure. Second, the numerator has what we call the, trans, the transpulmonary gradient, which is the difference between mean PA pressure and wedge pressure. That approach does not have an estimate for LAP. 
So based on its simplicity, you would say it doesn't perform well across the board. And yes, it does not perform well across the board. But if you start targeting extremes, for example, if you have a very high ratio, more than 0.38, you are virtually guaranteed that the pulmonary vascular resistance is elevated. Notice the value here, horrendously elevated, much, much more than the three woods units. How frequently do we get values in this range? Not frequent at all. If you look at values in the 0.12 to 0.15 range, these patients usually have a normal pulmonary vascular resistance. Again, these values assume that I have good signals here and I made correct measurements. In between, it's problematic with a lot of overlap. One study looked at this ratio in predicting hospitalizations due to heart failure and all-cause mortality called the Heart and Soul Study from the VA at San Francisco. A decent sample size, 795 patients with coronary disease, and that was an important independent predictor of these hard endpoints. Shifting gears to the RAP, so we all know the IVC, it's di it, how wide it is and what happens to its diameter from expiration to inspiration, the top panel, an IVC that completely collapses, the bottom panel, an IVC that is dilated and does not collapse. Easy so far. Yes. So the location where one wants to look at whether the IVC collapses or not is not at the junction, but more like one to two centimeters away from that junction. Even though it is not sort of shown this way in the guidelines, doing an M mode can be very useful, where you show it with the patient spontaneously breathing and with sniffing, and you would need to label so the reader can do these measurements. So how about the IVC collapse index? An IVC that collapses has, reflects a lower right atrial pressure. Many people, by the way, use the IVC collapse with the V scan in patients who present with hypotension or in the ICUs and they want to assess their volume status. This is based on the idea that if you have an IVC that is not dilated, that collapses spontaneously, their RAP is normal. And there, is, there are actually numerous studies that showed that for the most part this is true. This is work from this institution many years ago showing in patients who are not on mechanical ventilation in the solid circles, there is a nice inverse relation. The more the collapse, the lower the mean right atrial pressure. The open circles were obtained from patients who are on a mechanical ventilator. So the absence of an IVC collapse in a patient on mechanical ventilation is not a useful finding to draw conclusions about mean RAP. But if you see an IVC that is not dilated in someone on a mechanical ventilator, their RAP is usually normal. So a dilated and or a normal size IVC that does not collapse are not necessarily equal to elevated RAP in this population. These are the limitations, patients who cannot cooperate with you, you don't have a subcostal view. We talked already about the collapse in patients who uh, are on mechanical ventilation, where if you see a diameter 12 millimeters or less, you're good with an RAP less than 10. If it's more than 12, it has no predictive value. Notice that we are looking at an RAP estimation of 10. Most patients with most individuals with normal RAP walking around have an RAP close to zero millimeters mercury and most textbooks define the upper limit of normal at eight. So similar to the mitral inflow, you can get tricuspid inflow and you can get hepatic vein flows. Of course, directions reverse based on the location of the transducer. And as RAP goes up, the E to A ratio goes up. You see a significant association, though, with a wide spread. The guidelines recognize an E to A ratio less than 0.8 as abnormal and an E to A ratio more than 2 as also abnormal. The caveat, this is in patients with RV dysfunction, not in normal hearts. If you take a normal individual, they're dehydrated, their E to A ratio will drop, could be 0 0.6, 0 0.5, 
That doesn't mean they have diastolic dysfunction. Likewise, a normal individual walking around good RV function, their E to A ratio can be more than two and there is nothing wrong there in terms of filling pressures. So similar to the left side, mitral inflow and tricuspid inflow depend. Conclusions should be drawn after knowing whether RV function is normal or abnormal. You can look at hepatic venous flow similar to pulmonary venous flow. Forward flow in systole predominates normal RAP when they are equal, somewhere between five and 10, so could be normal, could be slightly elevated. Predominant diastolic flow or only forward diastolic flow mean signify an elevated RAP, and there is an inverse relation. The more the proportion of forward flow from the veins during systole compared to forward flow from the veins into the IVC during diastole, the lower the right atrial pressure. As that ratio drops, then the RAP is higher. So this is the group with the high ratio. This is the group with the lower ratio worked, whether there is mechanical ventilation or not. If you want to look to work with signals on the right side, any Doppler signal on the right side depends on the phase of respiration as well. So simple averaging of cardiac cycles is not as useful by itself. You need also to consider end expiration or average a good number of beats so you get beats during inspiration and beats during expiration as well. An example of someone with a very high RV and diastolic pressure, look at that atrial reversal, how tall it is and how long it is. Someone with tricuspid regurgitation and systolic reversal. By the way, systolic reversal may be seen in very sick hearts, even in the absence of a severe degree of tricuspid regurg. It has to do with the RA, RV compliance slash stiffness and the interaction between them. So these are limitations. If someone has pericardial disease, tricuspid valve disease, arrhythmias, heart transplants, be cautious in using them. And of course, if we don't have subcostal views, you can look at the E prime and you can look at the time interval between S systolic ejection velocity and E prime velocity, the so-called isovolumic relaxation time. This time interval gets shorter as RAP gets higher. And you can do an E to E prime ratio. And this is a study from a group in Japan that looked at the relation of the E to E prime ratio to outcome in patients with pulmonary hypertension. First, they show significant correlation. We've shown that before, but some patients had pulmonary hypertension, some did not. This is exclusively a pulmonary hypertension population, a very decent correlation. And also notice that the E to E prime ratio was an independent predictor of outcome and survival in this group of patients, albeit small numbers. Limitations to using E to E prime ratio as an index of RAP include pericardial compression syndromes, tricuspid valve disease, patients with arrhythmias and absence of apical views. This is a summary table. If there is an IVC collapse that is 50% or more, and you see predominant forward flow in systole in the hepatic veins, RAP is zero to five. If you see IVC collapse of at least 50%, but systolic equal diastolic, you may err on the side of five to 10. If you see collapse less than 50% and diastolic exceeding systolic, we're looking at an RAP 10 to 15, collapse less than 50% forward flow only in diastole 20 or above. You do not need to sort of go exactly the way I have shown it, but what you want to do is sort of put things together and look at what signals you have, technical-wise, which ones you trust, which ones you don't, and what is the physiologic situation so you sort of determine if there is discrepancy where you put your trust. Examples of RA uh, dilatation and the new guidelines speak of RA volume index and they give different values for women versus men, though again, based on very few patients. By the way, RA size in patients with HEFREF is a predictor of events, mostly hospitalizations for heart failure. Example of patients with pulmonary hypertension, very high PA diastolic velocity, TR of almost 4.5. And if you look at the hepatic veins, predominant flow in diastole, very large RV with a thick moderator band. Sometimes you can also see clots, flat septum, systole, and diastole, and very poor signals from someone with RV dysfunction. One last point. Uh, sometimes we are asked when patients with pulmonary hypertension is this is cardiac or non-cardiac. 
straightforward findings that point to the etiology being, for example, cardiac, say mitral valve disease, bad mitral stenosis, bad mitral regurg, a lot of aortic stenosis and LVH. So I'm finding something, coronary artery disease, depressed EF, congenital heart disease with, say, VSD and so on. But sometimes you end up with elderly individuals. They have, for sure, pulmonary hypertension, and it is not as clear-cut as the scenarios I gave you. So here, some sort of assessment of LAP can help you go one way or the other. If someone has LV dysfunction and they have what we call half PEF, then you would expect some abnormalities in the myocardium on the left side, and this would be manifested by the annular velocities. So in this case, the annular velocities for someone who is 60 is very decent, about 10 on the lateral side. Notice that the septal signals are lower, but the septum is shared between the RV and the LV. So if you have a good alignment with the lateral tissue Doppler signals of the lateral side of the mitral annulus, that would tip you to say this looks like a normal relaxation. And the odds are higher that this patient has pulmonary hypertension not due to an elevated LAP. And this is work we did years ago showing a group of patients with primary pulmonary hypertension versus secondary pulmonary hypertension, where the wedge is elevated by definition, more than 50 millimeters mercury here, less than that range there. And if you look at the average E to E prime ratio, all of the patients had values less than 10, whereas these, most of them had 12 or above. So that is a useful approach. These are some numbers you may want to look at. Of this table, the only numbers I would emphasize would be the TAPC, the SA velocity, the pulse Doppler myocardial performance index, the tissue Doppler myocardial performance index, and the fractional area change. 